Zingerman's. Um, if some of you may have heard of him, some of you may follow Zingerman's like crazy, some of you may not know what this company even is, that's all okay. I assure you, you're going to be inspired by this man's story. Um, I was yesterday and am every time that I hear from him. Uh, and he's really going to tell you how he didn't just build a company that now has over 700 employees. He built a company that was focused on giving back to the community, a company that was focused on empowering its employees, and a company that was focused on creating a better community in the communities that they worked with. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Mr. Paul Saginaw. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. The main reason I'm here uh, is because when I was a senior in high school, I was voted least likely to have a positive impact on society. <laughs> and, and, I was, and I, you know, I was just, uh, it was true for a long time. And so I'm trying to make up for that. So when Kimber uh, asked me if I would come and, and speak uh, to the group today, I, I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, I, I really, really like to do this and, uh, you know, kind of override that reputation that I had in high school. So, anyway, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to tell you a little bit about, about Zingerman's, uh, a little bit about the history, and, and talk about a, a few things that I think uh, have been key in, in driving us towards success. I'd like to talk to you about visioning. And, uh, and about uh, having a, uh, a, a clear vision of success for your organization, uh, the importance of guiding principles, and uh, talk to you a bit about uh, working in an open book uh, environment and managing in an open book environment. And uh, that's what I'd like to do. So, but to, uh, to begin with, again, I'd like to ask you to do something. I want to have a pop quiz. So this time I would I'd like to ask all of you to close your eyes and with an outstretched arm point in the direction that you believe is north. Okay, so keep your, your arms up and open your eyes and we pretty much <laughs> we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Okay? Because we're down here in, in, in Phoenix. We're in we're in Phoenix. And, uh, and we got to get up to the Canadian border uh, by by nightfall. Uh, so let's see. We can uh, we could appoint a committee, a subcommittee, and we could ask them to go out and uh, you know come back with a proposal, or we could uh, we could just take a, a vote. You know, majority rules. Or but lucky for you, uh, I have. Uh, the iPhone has a compass, right? And it's saying that saying that magnetic north is uh -oh. in that direction. Uh, who was pointing in a different direction? <laughs> Anybody want to argue with this? <laughs> I mean, you, you were holding your arm up there pretty firmly, right? <laughs> you, you're not going to, right? Because it's a it's a natural law. And we pay attention to natural laws, otherwise we get in really, really big trouble. Uh, have any of you, did any of you grow up? Well, here, how many people went to school? <laughs> how many people have taken a test? How many people have crammed for a test? How did that work out? You know, well, right? Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes you forget. You know, sometimes it's a disaster that that is performing at a very high level. Then it, it's it's critical that that you have a uh, serious training program and you put all the resources that are necessary, and that you have to give folks very very clear uh, documented expectations, so that they it's. They know whether they're doing a good job or not. Another one is if you want to stay in business over a long period of time, your customer has to perceive value in your product or service. And if you want to, if you want your staff to give really, really great service, then then you, as a leader in your organization, have to give great service to your staff. You you have no right to ever expect 
that, that the people that work for you are going to uh, provide a, a service level uh, to your customers that's higher than you're providing to your staff. And then one that I, I feel very, very strongly about is if you want to have a successful business, product launch, uh, new policy, uh, sales initiative, marketing plan, whatever it is, you have to be able to very, very clearly define what success looks like. In our organization, we call that a vision. Uh, for us, a vision is, is a definition of success so that if everything goes the way you want it to go, at some point in the future that you pick, what exactly does that look like? Uh, we, we, call that, we call that a vision. And we believe that there is no more powerful engine driving an organization toward long-term success than a, a, an attractive, inspiring, strategically sound, inclusive, hopeful vision of the future. Calling out to everybody saying, this is where we're going and it's going to be great and you, you have a role in it. Uh, I didn't see that. So that's, a, uh, that's where we start. I'm going to talk to you now. Uh, a little bit about our history, and then I'm going to get back to vision. So, so keep vision in mind. Anyway, uh, so back in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay, so you know it's a small college town, about 150,000 people, and uh, this building here, uh, this was built in 1902 uh, by the Dyroff family, the Desiree family, and the, the grocer lived upstairs, and actually this house. That blue house there sat on the corner and was pulled back, and then they they built this building. And the grocer lived upstairs with his family, and that was and it's right on the, the edge of this residential neighborhood. If you you know you go back from there, it's it's all residences. And next to us is a is a uh, magnet high school, and uh, and that that family ran that place until about 1980, 1979, 1980, and that grocer retired. Uh, and, he, and he sold the building to someone who uh, started a little cafeteria in their restaurant, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it sucked. And, it, and, and, <laughs> and, and after about six or seven months, uh, it closed, and, uh, and then, when we, when I knew that it was available, uh, that's where we were going to open this deli. So my partner, uh, to be Ari Weinzweig and I, we met in Ann Arbor in the late '70s, working in a restaurant together. Uh, I, I had come down there from another uh, restaurant uh, to be a, the general manager, and this was the second restaurant in what would become this uh, local chain of restaurants. Unique. And for us, by definition, that meant there's going to only be one of us. And that if we were ever going to grow or expand, we would never do it by replication. And really, it wasn't, at that time, it wasn't an ideology for us. Uh, it just, it was, one, we had never seen something that was really, really good and expanded by replication and got better. It seemed to lose something. Have any of you ever been to the original Starbucks and uh, Pike Market? Oh. Quite a few. So, you know, for me, when I go in there, there's still there's a sense of history, there's an energy level that's palpable. Uh, have any of you been to the uh, Starbucks on the Turnpike? Or in a grocery store? Or is it exciting? You know, is, 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 is there a sense of history? Uh, you know, it's pretty terrible. So that, you know, we want, that's not what we wanted, right? So, uh, and then, so we said that we were going to be unique, and uh, we said that we were going to, uh, we, we wanted an organization where decisions were not going to be made based on who had the most authority, but rather who had a solution, who had an idea, who had information and data that was relevant to the issues at hand. We wanted to, we wanted to, to drive uh, decision making as deeply and as widely into the organization as we could and invite everybody to come in and help run the business. Uh, we had come out of an organization that was 
very command and control, very top down, and we felt that they were really missing the boat, and that the real knowledge was buried in the in the folks, uh, the folks on the front line had ideas, had solutions, knew what was going on, but they buried that and didn't really bring it out because there wasn't a way for them to do it. And we wanted to do that. It took us a long time to learn how to do that, but it certainly was a driver from the beginning. And then we also said that we made the very strategic decision that we were going to gather this food, we are going to produce this food, we are going to deliver it to folks with an extremely high level of customer service. This was 1982 and nobody talked about customer service. Customer service at that time was merely transactional and it was only things that happened after a sale, you know, when the shoes were the wrong color or the dress didn't fit, that, that type of stuff. And if you went to the bookstore back then and you went to the business section and you wanted a book on customer service, you wouldn't find it. You would have to special order it and it would most likely be an academic publication. You could go into the bookstore now and there's dozens and dozens of volumes on customer service. One of them is better than the other ones. It's called Singerman's Guide to Giving Great Service. <laughs> <laughs> but that's near the hair and But anyways, but we were going to introduce a lot of the, these new products to people that they never heard of, that cost a lot more than they were used to paying. And we needed, we, so we said, well, we're going to make coming here an experience. That you're not just coming to meet your nutritional needs or, or you know, fill your, your cupboards at home with the groceries that you need, but you were going to be entertained and you were going to be educated and you were going to be treated like royalty. Uh, and when, you know, it's true that when we opened up we had products that you could not get anywhere else. But today, uh, you can get most of those products at, at three dozen places within a five mile radius of, of that building there. But still only at Zingerman's are you going to get that Zingerman experience where we are going to wow you and service the hell out of you and have you understand that you are absolutely the most important part of our day and the only reason that we got up and came in and opened the door and turned the sign on and put the drawer in the register was on the chance that you would grace us with your patronage. I don't know about Phoenix, but I can tell you in Ann Arbor, nobody gets up in the morning and says, if I don't get a $15 sandwich, I'll kill myself. <laughs> or if I don't get a quarter of a pound of a $36 a pound cheese, life isn't worth living. It just doesn't happen. We had to give them a reason, and that was going to be that we were going to just give them this great service. And moreover, we were going to provide that service to each other within the organization, and we were going to provide it to the community at large. And so when we wrote our business plan, and we were going, doing the budget, and, and writing down the line items for the expenses, you had insurance, and you have labor, and you have cost of goods, and you have utilities, and we had giving back. So giving back to the community was not something we were going to do once we became profitable. It was, for us, it was going to be one of the costs of doing business. And if that business plan didn't, didn't pan out right, then we had to go back to the drawing board until it did. Because we believe that you earn your right to do business in a community. That businesses are institutions that have enormous impact positive or negative on the communities in which they do business and we wanted to be a good corporate citizen. And so uh, one of the things that we do is we, we give back 10% of all profit from all our businesses and I'll talk about all of them uh, every year uh, back to the nonprofit sector in our county. And, we, and then we take another 5% of all that profit and we put it into a fund called the Community Chest, and that is an emergency relief fund for our employees who are experiencing a financial crisis that's not of their own doing. Like, I got really wasted, and I drove my car off the road, and I need $3,500 to fix it, can you help? No, you're stupid, don't drink and drive. But, but, my spouse has been unemployed for 18 months and I'm going to be evicted. Or uh, I just went through a divorce and it's terrible and, and they're going to foreclose on my mortgage. Or my mother is very, very ill, close to death. 
out in California and I can't even afford a ticket out there. Those are things that, 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 that we take care of. And what we were eating was starting to become, uh, occupy a, a bigger part of the public's consciousness. Uh, it's when we first knew the name of celebrity chefs, you know, you would know Wolfgang Puck. And so it was a very, very heavy time. And things were going good. And, and, th and we were cruising along uh, through, the, through the first 10 years. Nine, eight, nine years, about nine years into it. Uh, there were things that were going on uh, in the business that were causing some concern. Uh, sales had flattened out and profitability was going down and there didn't seem to be the same esprit de corps. And, uh, and we now had a formal leadership team and there was a lot of argument, uh, disagreement among that team you know, where's, where's the opportunities? How do we take advantage of them? Where are the threats coming from? How do we mitigate those threats? There was a lot of risk avoidance. It's like, hey, we're Zingermans, we're cool, let's not rock the boat, let's not do anything crazy. Complacency was setting in, bureaucracy was setting in. Those leaders started to believe that their authority was vested in their title. And we, my partner and I wanted an organization where the, the authority of the leaders was willingly given to them by the people that they were leading because they viewed them as competent and consistent and fair and committed to their success. And then also, uh, when you would, you, back then and to this day, when you would come and work for us, uh, you would go through a lot of training classes, a lot of orientation classes, but one of them called Welcome to Zingermans is only taught, the only class that's only taught by my partner Ari or myself. And it's the last thing I think we would ever delegate. As long as the founders are, are able, I think it's very important that we welcome every single person that's going to work for us into the organization and they spend two hours with us. Not individually, you know, with that many people in classes, but, and, and in that class, from going all the way back to them, you know, I look at and say, you know, you can make this job anything you want it to be. And, and if you want to have a career with us, then I have a responsibility along with you to see that that happens. It wasn't ringing true anymore. We were this tiny little building. We weren't going to open up more Zingermans. The leadership slots were filled. We were young. We weren't dropping dead left and right. And, and there was almost no turnover at that level. So if you, if you wanted to grow professionally and you wanted to grow financially, then we had no room for you. And we were going to lose you. And we were going to lose you to our competition after we taught you really well how to compete with us. So these things were all going around in my mind. And one day I grabbed Ari. We said we would open 10 to 12 businesses over the next 15 years. And they would all be local. And they would all carry the Zingerman name. And we wouldn't do anything unless it was representing a quality improvement uh, uh, over what we were doing. And we wanted to have a synergy where we would be customers and suppliers of each other within this community of businesses. And, and that's what we did. So when, when we first opened, there was my partner, Ari and myself, and two employees. We did a little under $100 our first day. And uh, this past uh, July, we ended our 35th fiscal year with $66 million in sales. Uh, across 10 operating businesses and there are uh, 17 managing partners, there's three staff partners and, and there's two founding partners. Every one of those partners started as a regular employee and they are now owners in the organization. All of those businesses are separate legal entities, they don't own each other. Uh, we are voluntarily a loose confederation and we share a brand we share a vision and we share a set of guiding principles. And so we've created this opportunity for anybody that works for us to become a partner in the organization. And we have a very clear, documented uh, path to partnership that is, that is open to anybody. And so, uh, but what, what's really, what really drove, and now 2009 has come and gone, and then we had a uh, vision for 2020 and that's coming up quickly, so now we're starting to work on the next long-term vision, which really isn't my work anymore, because there's a good chance I won't be here at the end of that vision. And so it's, uh, I, if they want my 
if they think that I have valuable input, I'm I, something of value to contribute, I'm happy, but I really want it to be driven by the next generation of uh, partners and uh, managers in our organization. Uh, so I wanted to share with you how we, uh, our, uh, how we view our structure, uh, how we conduct business within the organization. So this is a graphic representation of what we call the, the Zingerman's Business Perspective Chart. And this is for everybody to be able to look at and understand what's going on and what their role is within the organization. And so the, uh, the border all around it is, says the Zingerman Experience. That's our mission. Our mission is to provide the Zingerman Experience to as many people as we possibly can. Uh, and it's, it's uh, characterized by really great product and really great service and that we're going to show love and care in all our actions. And, and we do that for as many people as we can to improve their lives. The, the, the mission is a really, really, really big goal that you know you're not going to quite accomplish. For us, it's the North Star. It provides essential direction for the organization and tells us what we're doing. I know that every day I go to work, my job is to provide the Zimmerman experience for the people that work for me and for the customers that come. So it's a really big goal that we don't quite accomplish. Right underneath it, you see vision. Vision is another really big goal, but we believe that we're going to be successful in accomplishing it. It's measurable, it's achievable, it's, and, and, uh, and I'll get back to that. And then we, we know how we're doing when we're doing the work of the mission and we're trying to, uh, to meet these, these goals that are in the vision, we, we measure results. And me measuring results tell us if we're on track or not. And if we have to change, you know, tack left, tack right, as if we're sailing across the waters. We measure, we have three bottom lines. Uh, great food, great service, and great finance. We have, we have goals and measurements, metrics for each one of those. Uh, we're not successful unless we meet all of those. What helps us turn that vision into the results, the reality that we want, are our principles. Our principles are important in two specific areas. In one, they're going to define the levels of excellence that we're going to strive for so that everybody's efforts are going in the right direction. So if we say great food or great service, we have a system that allows us to get there. The systems are the tools that allow us to achieve the levels of excellence that we've defined are necessary for us to meet. The systems are how we say things are supposed to happen. Okay, they're the tools that allow us to achieve excellence. The other area in which the vision, in which the principles are important, is, is the culture. They're, it's going to define the culture or the personality of the organization. How do we relate with each other within the company, with our customers, with our suppliers, with the media, with the, with the rest of the world? It defines those relationships. All of you are in organizations that have some principles, whether they're written or not, whether they're spoken or not. They're going to emerge. We believe it's better to write them down so that you are defining the culture that you want. And, and when you write, when they're written, and when they're taught, during orientation and, and when they're referred to when we make decisions, it's exactly the same as if I'm standing in front of the entire organization and I'm saying, I promise you that this will be the reality within this company without exception. And if I keep that promise, I have the greatest asset that any employer can have. I'm going to have the trust of the people that work with me. And if I have that trust, we can be extraordinary. And we can accomplish great things. And we can get through really tough times. 
and we can have enormous joy in our work while we're doing all that. If I don't keep that promise, I squander that capital, I lose their trust, we're going to be like every other middling organization up and down the block. We want to be an organization that, that, that walks the talk. We, the systems are how we say things should happen, the culture is how it's actually happening. We do not want to have a big systems culture gap. Have any of you out there ever worked for an organization where there was a big difference between what they purported they were and how they behaved? Anybody? What was that like? Fun? <laughs> annoying? Kind of goes from mildly annoying to absolutely toxic. We don't want to be that organization. We are a principally driven organization. That is what makes us different. We believe that's our strategic differentiator. We do not have anything, we have no proprietary products. We make a lot of our own products, but anybody can. They can get the recipes out of cookbooks just like we did. We don't have patents, we don't have, we don't have any of those things. What we have is a set of principles that, that we make every attempt to live by. We fall short every day, we bear the consequences, we ask for forgiveness, we forgive each other, we move forward with grace. And there's a cost to that innovation. And that cost starts high. And if things are going well, it's going to go down over time and stabilize, right? You've gone to whoever is in charge of okaying a purchase, and you're saying, I know this looks expensive, but it's going to pay for itself, right? Most of you have said that at some point, okay? And then what we're looking for is, is a return on that innovation. And that return starts out low, and if things are going well, it's going to ramp up over time. So over here, we sat in the room. We had our strategic retreat. We came up with all these great ideas. We bursted out of that room, and we're butting chests, and we're slapping high five. And then down at the other end, we're looking, and by every metric that we put in place, we're like, wow, you know, we've been successful. Now we're popping the champagne, and we're slapping high fives again. In between there, is this zone. I call that the zone of doubt and blame. <laughs> it wasn't my idea. I knew it was stupid the minute it came out of your mouth. <laughs> well, well, wait a second. But you sat in that room with everybody. Yeah, but I didn't want to be a wet blanket. Everybody seemed so excited about it, OK? You cannot get from here, here to hear without going through that zone, right? You guys laugh because you have all, at one time or another, been in that zone of doubt. Many of you are in it right now. Some of us live in it, because it could be days, months, years, decades. Anybody, uh, has anybody had an organization where somebody came and, you know, you were gonna get new enterprise software and it was gonna connect everything together and it was gonna be the greatest thing in the world? And then it was just this total nightmare. You know, it was, well, that, that's the zone of doubt and blame. You know, we have former employees who are all over the country uh, with their own businesses, uh, very successful. And we are always, we're thrilled when that happens. I'm, I feel like we failed if someone has gone down, made a move down, or even maybe lateral. But when they're going out there and... Uh, trying their own, it's, it's very good training for, for running your own business. I think more than anything, I think we are a business incubator. I think we're a better one for a couple of reasons. Uh, traditional in incubators measure success on an idea getting funding, and we measure it on being, being uh, qualified by the customer, turning the idea into real revenue. And, uh, and then also, we, I, you know, we have shared services. So we have a, one of the businesses, Aaron Service Network, which is HR, uh, payroll, benefits administration, IT, marketing and graphics, donations, customer service, and uh, that's a shared service. And so startups uh, have a level of 
technical and administrative expertise that they desperately need but can need, never afford, but they're subsidized by the ongoing businesses. So yeah, we do look at that and we have folks all over the country. And the world, actually. One more. When we first uh, came out with our guiding principles, and we were talking about roles, my role was like, not the principal police, but like the gatekeeper on the guiding principles. So I, you know, like the, I'm the one in the organization that's poking folks, saying, you know, we're not diverse enough. We're not paying enough money. You know, let's, how are we going to do that? So that's how that title came about. And then it kind of stuck. All right. Thank Great. you very much.